Okay, welcome aboard. My name's John, I'm the uh, third mate on here. Uh, and that makes me the junior most of the uh, bridge officers, the uh, bottom of the top as I like to call it. So, uh, welcome aboard the Sekuliak. Uh, brand new ship, we just took delivery of her back in June of last year. was up in Marinette, Wisconsin. Uh, I had her up on the Great Lakes for about a month getting her uh, loaded out, put together. Then we sailed out of the Great Lakes, did Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, uh, Welland Canal, past Niagara Falls up to uh, Lake Ontario, then out through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, then spent a couple weeks down to Woods Hole, Massachusetts where they were helping us out, get some of our science equipment ready to go. Uh, down to Puerto Rico, uh, sailed in and out of San Juan for uh, around about 10 days. Um, again, testing out science equipment through the Panama Canal up to Hawaii. And Hawaii was our first science mission working in the Papahanaumokuakea Kea National Marine Monument that runs from Hawaii up to Midway Island. And uh, then back to Hawaii and then out to Guam for uh, more research. And uh, we just finished that up. Uh, about mid-January and sailed up here straight from Guam. So I want to show you around, uh, show you some of the equipment that we've got on the ship, uh, how we're set up to, to work and then get you up to the bridge and show you some of our equipment up there. So first off is the Baltic Room. Everybody likes to ask what kind of research we do and the, the answer is actually I don't know. Uh, there, there's very little that we're actually set up specifically to do. Uh, I always describe this ship as being like an erector set or a Lego set uh, for the kids. Uh, that this is, it's a generic platform. We provide the ship, we provide some science facilities and an awful lot of capability, but we're gonna do whatever the scientists show up and uh, whatever equipment they bring. Sikuliak will be the most well-equipped research vessel in the whole uh, academic fleet, which is called the UNOLS fleet. Everybody in this uh, ecosystem approach comes with their piece of gear, so they all want to be able to operate that at the same time or at least during the same cruise. For my work in particular, um, having a larger vessel with um, enough deck space to, to comfortably move around and and handle gear over the side is going to be a, a big benefit. The Sekuliak is going to have three winches as I understand um, and they are made for deploying the type of gear that we're going to be deploying and that's huge. I mean if it is if it is gear that is made to deal with what, what we need to deploy um, that's going to change things completely. The bigger gears and those that require live feeds for example and cables that are conducting so that bring back a live feed of video or temperature or whatever sensor you might have in the ocean. That's something that Sikulek is very well designed for um, and some of the older retrofitted ships are not prepared for. Sikulek has a uh, capability to have real-time virtual interaction with classrooms. From my point of view that's huge. Um, as of right now sometimes we have teachers that come on board and are able to document their experiences and take those back take the experiences back to the classrooms. Um, but to be able to interact real time with the scientists on board, to have wireless capabilities to be able to do that, that's really a recent phenomenon. And for the Sekuliak to come set up for that kind of interaction is, is incredible. I think outreach is one of the biggest things that, that my generation of scientists is, is going to be want, wanting to be involved in. Uh, this right here is one of the few things that is obviously a, a part of the ship. It's called a uh, CTD. It stands for Conductivity, Temperature, and Density. Um, that said, we can measure an awful lot with it. Uh, yes, right there, they actually hooked a GoPro camera up to this thing for a shallow test cast. So you can see it coming up. You can start to see the uh, side of the ship there. Uh, we can use the uh, arm here of the shuttle to, to raise up off the deck scoot it out through uh, this hatch that opens up the side of the ship, drop it down, uh, 
we've got two winches that we can hook into this. Each winch has several miles worth of cable on it. Uh, you can drop these things down. I think they told me their uh, deepest cast was 5,100 meters. That's just over three miles. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.3 statute miles, I think. Uh, yeah, so th these cylinders have uh, uh, spring-loaded caps on the top and the bottom. And the cable isn't just your ordinary wire rope. There's actually a uh, data cable that runs down through that and hooks into a computer that they've removed for some uh, maintenance right now. And either automatically, uh, you know, programming computer, or with uh, some poor undergraduate that's still that's just sitting there in the uh, control room pressing a button. Uh, they they can trigger these things. They call them, call it firing the uh, cylinder where the two ends. Are, are kind of locked open as it drops down when they fire it it, it clamps it uh, that tube shut and allows them to take uh, data samples take samples of water up to 24 of them all in the same place in one water column so they can see how different properties of the uh, the water changes are going up and down uh, and again it, it's called uh, uh, conductivity, temperature, and density, but really it's whatever kind of work they want to do with it. <laughs> okay, so this is a wet lab, and uh, officially this is where the, the scientists bring their samples for their initial processing. Unofficially this is where they make a mess so they don't track it through the rest of the ship. But this is, again, it, it, it's generic. Uh, you can see we've got the lab tables, we've got a, a freshwater filtering system, a fume hood, but we're not really set up. Uh, it's not like I can point to something and say that's where they do this type of test. It's whatever kind of equipment they want to bring on board and uh, you know everything on here, even if you look at the deck, all these circles uh, are actually uh, mounting points to take out the uh, plug and they can bolt their own equipment right into the deck and basically turn this laboratory into whatever it is that they need it to do. Uh, so yeah, we just provide the generics. Uh, this is a freezer. I believe this is one that drops it down to uh, 40 below zero to flash free samples. And so yeah, this is all their basic processing. And then from here, they can come into the main lab Yes. So this is where they can do uh, uh, their final processing, but again, everything on here is generic. So uh, really the, the, the past few science missions, this has been set up more as a computer lab and operation center than as like a high school chemistry lab. Um, the video that we're seeing right here is from our last science trip looks like we just caught the end of it. Uh, basically, they, they controlled, they were using that guy right there. It's called the uh, Sentry, uh, which is an underwater robot. And they just set up this room as a control station for Sentry. Um, and then some of the uh, grad students and undergrads had their little, uh, had, had their own workstation set up in here. But yeah, so again, just all generic, all whatever. The, the scientists need, uh, whatever the technicians need, we, we can set up for that. Um, yeah, good view of that. Microphones under the vessel that we look at uh, sound that the ship generates, or it could be a far field sound. We could maybe <coughs> pick up some clicks or whistles from cetaceans. We have a uh, 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 mapping system, so we can actually port the multi beam data onto our mapping system. We, we have that right here. We can actually uh, rotate a camera around our, our what we plotted and actually look at the bottom topography in 3D. Um, we have some underway data, met data, and sea surface data. We do look at 
uh, chlorophyll and, and temperature and temperature and salinity of the water. That's all being recorded and it goes to a national archive. All the data that we collect uh, is recorded and supported to a national archive and then it's made public. Uh, so if it's uh, involving somebody's research, they might hold on to it for two years so the person can publish the data, but it's all made public. Uh, we have satellite systems to, to get access to the internet. Uh, this is actually a web page that we often bring up to look at weather conditions. It's a, uh, it's a mathematical model of uh, whether it's nullschool.net, you can get it at home. Nullschool.net. So, um, right now our next venture is going to be up into the ice uh, after our port stop in Juneau and Seward. And, uh, so we're already trying to look at the ice development. This is about 13 days worth of, of satellite imagery, so you can see the ice is moving quite quickly. This is uh, St. Lawrence Island right there, so the, the ice is moving at an incredible rate. And this is the March is the time when it uh, uh, really picks up speed. And, no, it's going down. This is, it's, uh, it, the ice edge is increasing. So in March, we should have the largest ice cover, and then it should start receiving green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Come on in. Yeah, I tried doing that several times a day, every day. Oh my God. Keep them set. I wonder they're all in good shape, right? I miss my old wheel and throttles and I, I was just telling the other guy yeah just telling the, the other guy that first shift or the, the last shift that I was on had nice mechanical linkages and yeah yeah you ready <laughs> Sorry, just got asked, when were you on Northwind? 1958-59. Uh, okay, that predates even uh, uh, when I was uh, sailing Westerdwind, which is a private research ship, had a guy named John Burns, and he his very first time sailing as chief scientist was on the Northwind. That was back in the uh, mid-70s. 70s, okay. Yep. Yeah, I was down there in Operation Decrease 4. <laughs> Oh, that is amazing. Yeah. Went to the Little America Park, <laughs> Cape Hallett, cool. and then out on the peninsula doing rescue work for the uh, British okay. uh, research station. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the bridge. This is where we drive the ship from. I think you've all probably figured out, and that's what you do on the bridge. Um, not a bridge like probably what most of you have seen or remember. Um, it's not even what I'm used to really. Uh, gone are the days of a, a good old fashioned uh, ship's wheel, you know, no engine order telegraph or no, uh, no throttles. We've got joysticks. Um, so we've got up here are really three different computer systems. Over here, these two computers are the uh, engineering system, and the engineers frown upon us pressing buttons up here, but we've got pretty much all the capability up here that the engineers have down below, and uh, can look at almost everything that they can. Uh, then the next one over, this is one of six computers that are all networked together. It's called the Integrated Bridge System. And this is how we actually drive and navigate the ship. So, and all of these computers are all monitoring the same information all at the same time. So if I'm over here and I want to look at the radar, press a button and we, we can uh, call up 
uh, two different types of radar on, on each station. Over here, we see. Does that mean that they can pick up the names of the police that are nearby you? <laughs> that radar? Uh, that's actually called uh, AIS, uh, Automated Identification System. And, okay, no, I won't tell you all about it. The, the, the simple version is uh, it's. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually goes out on VHF. Uh, a, a VHF radio channel and gets picked up by a little black box uh, by a VHF antenna and then we can look at the information over there or it can display on the radar. It will even display on the chart plotter. And the, uh, like the, on the pollution ballard that's presented there, do they volunteer to have you find them? Uh, there's nothing voluntary about it. They have to have it. Oh. And so um, because it's a commercial vessel? Right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and they actually broadcast a lot of information. You'll learn an awful lot about a ship just looking at their AIS feed. Uh, but yeah, so all that information gets distributed out. Like I say, I can look at it on the radar. Uh, I can get the exact same thing on our chart plotter. I can overlay a radar onto our chart plotter. Um, the, the chart plotter is basically like your little Garmin GPS, only much more complicated. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what we use for our navigation. Um, and it's also, <sighs> pains me to say this, we've got some old sailors here, some real sailors. This is how we drive the ship. I'm sorry, Th this is it. We, we press buttons on a computer screen. Um, for what it's worth, we can drive by hand and we use these two guys right here, uh, basically joysticks. Uh, uh, for, for steering the ship. The reason we use joysticks and rather than rather than a uh, traditional wheel, uh, probably a few too many in here to see it, but on, on the side of the uh, bl uh, blue cabinet here is a picture of our uh, thruster system. If you're familiar with the Z drive that they use on tugboats, it's very similar to that. So we've got two of these thruster pods down there and each thruster can actually rotate 360 degrees. And uh, so that's why we use the joysticks. We can pretty much point those whatever direction we need to to, to get the kind of uh, thrust we're looking for. And in addition to that, we've got the uh, bow thruster here. Um, I've always been on ships with a good old fashioned uh, tunnel thruster. This one is actually an omnidirectional thruster where it draws in water from the side and squirts it out a vent down the bottom and that vent can rotate 360 degrees. Um, so the reason that we're set up with that kind of equipment is because of this computer or maybe the computers here because of that equipment chickens and eggs uh, this is our dynamic positioning system okay uh, the navigation equipment that we've got on board the, the gps antennas that we have uh, and the, just the type of gps system that we use we can uh, get the position of the ship accurate to within about 20 centimeters about this far and then using this uh, dynamic positioning system, we can hold the ship within about three feet of a position that we wanted to. And when I say three feet, it's not like, you know, here's a spot and some place inside the skin of the ship is gonna be on that spot. We can tell, use the dynamic position computer to tell it um, we want the end of our CTD boom to be on this spot and it will park it within three feet. So when a scientist says, we want to take a sample at this exact lat and long, we can get them pretty much at that exact lat and long. Uh, I mean, basically we can be more accurate than the ocean, meaning that once they've got two miles of cable down and there's current down there, the, 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 the CTD is gonna be less accurate. It's gonna be further off position than we are with the ship. Okay, um, and yeah, all of that, the, what I was talking about with the thrusters, the bow thruster, uh, all of that's controlled through the uh, DP computer. Um, we do actually practice station keeping by hand, but uh, when I'm driving by hand to, to hold station, it's all reactive. It's all me looking at, well, the ship's starting to turn this way, so now I've got to turn it the other way. The, 
DP system actually has a computer model of the ship and it's tied into our uh, wind gauges, it's tied into our uh, Doppler speed log, it's looking at what the water's doing underneath the ship, it's tied into motion sensors and can tell how much we're rolling, how much we're pitching and feeds all of this into the computer model and will actually become predictive. So when the computer starts to realize, you know, and it has no idea what a wave is, but it knows that every eight seconds we surge this way. So every seven and a half seconds, say, it will give a little boost of power to push the ship this way because it knows that it's gonna, gonna hit, get hit by another wave. So, and for all that, um, we still navigate on paper charts. We came up here on paper charts. And yes, I still pull out a sextant whenever I've got a uh, clear sky and go out and shoot stars. Because if you're a sailor, you don't trust anything electronic around salt water. So, this is our captain, by the way. And uh, I, think, I think John should get a round of applause. <laughs> very good. Because we're, I, I'll just say that. Uh, uh, we, we go to sea because uh, we're, we're not very social people, you know. We, uh, <laughs> this is very out of the normal for us, but uh, we're, we're happy to be able to provide these tours, this, uh, this opportunity for people to see this vessel. So, anyways, I, thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go out the uh, back door here and uh, show you a few things on deck as we head back down to the main deck. We've got four engines, uh, um, too big, too small for a total of about 5,700 horsepower. And um, yeah, the, we don't even call them engines anymore. They're just generators. Uh, all they do is put out electricity and uh, it goes to electric motors that drive the uh, thrusters. Just so, a real quick note, what, what kind of backup power do you have? You talked about plotting by hand. Right. And what, have you. Yep. what happens when, you, when, you, when, you, when it goes dark? Yeah, when it goes dark. Um, well, I mean, the dumb answer is E-Gen. Uh, we've got uh, all kinds of uh, UPS, uh, Universal Power System, uh, to back up the, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it, it's a little bit concerning when uh, things start getting dark because, you know, the engines rely on the computers to keep them running. And so, okay. yeah. Okay, so we're going to keep going. Uh, I want to get everybody down on this deck and we'll just go out to the little platform here. C drive, a Z? It, we call it a C drive. It, it's basically a Z drive except that they uh, face the propellers forward. And the reason they do that is the propellers are actually intended to chew up ice. So. The, the propellers are really there when we're going through ice. They're, they're there to, in front to protect the rest of the pod for, from the ice. Well, it's but essentially what I've always called an acid pod. Exactly, yeah. The, the guys we've got coming on board who've driven Z drives before, they just grab the sticks and go. It, it, it handles exactly the same. With electric propulsion. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, two huge electric motors back there, um, four, four diesel generators that, that, that put out power for that, and yeah, that's it. Um, and a very scientific touch, I see. Yeah, yeah, th this is kind of our lounge deck. Uh, <laughs> well, it was when we were in Hawaii and Guam, not so much now. How much did this ship cost to build? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 million. 250 million? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a nice chunk of change. Uh, it's, it was built from about 2012, I think they laid, uh, I'm sorry, late 11, when they laid the keel, uh, until we took delivery in uh, June of 2014. So, I just always like to stop off here. It's a really good view of our uh, working deck. Uh, you see all the different equipment that we use. First of all, we've got our work boat. Uh, when you're down in Antarctic ice, you can kind of ram the whole ship up next to the ice, put over a ladder, you climb down, go do what you got to do. North ice, not quite that thick, so we'll have to put down the work boat, use that to shuttle science parties over to the ice, um, or anything else that they want to do with it, fishing, that sort of thing. Uh, and then out here, our uh, back deck, we've got two cranes. Uh, 
Oh, we actually intentionally downgraded the one crane to 10,000 10, pounds just so it would move a little bit faster. Uh, the, the port side crane can lift about 20,000 pounds. Then we've got an A-frame, which this one's good for about 10,000, and we're going to get upgraded to shipyard this year. Uh, uh, also, we've got a science control room right here, and this is an alternate conning station for us. And so I can drive the ship from in here, and uh, our science techs or our deck crew who are driving cranes or running the A-frame can do everything right there so you can sit there and talk to each other. And um, it's actually really weird. It's great for the guys who are uh, doing stuff on deck. It's really weird to drive the ship from up there because you're standing backwards. And some of the controls, the controls are still set up like you're facing forwards. So I describe it as trying to rub your belly and pat your head at the same time, but do it when you're looking in a mirror and do it so that your reflection does everything in the right direction. It's really confusing, it takes a little while to get used to. Um, uh, just a huge amount of flexibility with this. Right, yep, yeah, they can stand there. Right, but they also, uh, we've got some uh, remote control belly packs Um, the, the, it's a wireless system, so today, if you would have seen our guys uh, offloading trash when the dumpster got here, our bosun just put on a belly pack and stood up there right next to the dumpster okay. and, and drove the crane. And Somebody down there might take yeah. a little Right, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of flexibility in how we run the deck, uh, uh, and, and we do it every way. Uh, we'll put a deck supervisor on deck giving signals to a guy up here in the uh, booth or we'll put a guy right down there and yeah it really helps to just be able to walk along with the load and tell guys I'm gonna move right I'm gonna move left yeah uh, in addition to the uh, CTD and the two winches on that we've got two more winches uh, you can see the two rectangles there on deck beneath that are uh, two more drums our, our oceanographic cables with somewhere on the order of eight miles of cable each And uh, we can run those up through a uh, block over here and either out through a, uh, a block on the A-frame. And by block, the, these pulleys stand about this high. Uh, yeah, we can run them out through the A-frame. We could even hook them onto the cranes and use the cranes to swing something out to uh, the side of the ship. So we can run conceivably up to uh, three cables, ha have three instrument packages hanging off the back of the ship all at the same time. Um, on that, uh, any more questions? What do you think you'll be focusing your testing on in Alaska while you're here? Well, right, uh, our upcoming mission is uh, ice trials. Uh, we got a little bit of ice trials when we were uh, being built up in the Great Lakes and just how the schedule worked out they had to take the ship out uh, when the lakes were frozen over but now is the uh, real serious trials uh, we actually have uh, teams uh, from various science agencies from the American Bureau of Shipping on board right now just putting sensor packages all over the hull so that they can measure our uh, stress loads as we go up and uh, start working in the ice so our schedule has us here for a couple days then up in Juneau for a few days then over to Seward for three weeks as we get ready for ice trials. And then from, uh, from Seward, we're, we're gonna sail around, we'll stop at Dutch for a day or so, and then we're gonna go north and try to find some ice. Um, that'll really be it. We think of it as this year, uh, just because of when we took delivery, all of a sudden our, our year is running from like June to June rather than December to December. But that'll be it for this year, we go to dry dock, and then our next set of science starts and are you primarily northern or we are yeah we're supposed to be primarily arctic but we are a global class ship so in theory at least we can be deployed anywhere in the world and you have university of alaska Fairbanks. right We don't own that, this ship. No, the, the ship is actually owned by the National Science Foundation, and all of the crew, the, it's own, or operated and managed by uh, UAF. So all of the crew are actually UAF employees. And, oh, yep. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the director, the UAF pretty much controls the, the whole program. It, it's run out of the uh, Seward Marine Center, which is run by the Fairbanks School of Fisheries. So, with that, I think we'll start heading down, get everybody out of the wind, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. What an honor to have you here. I, I want to know a little bit more about the background on this program because I could totally see the glee on your face as we are getting ready to board. You're so excited. This has been a long time coming. The actual first proposal for an ice strengthened vessel for the University of Alaska Fairbanks was written in 1973. And we've been working since then to get this ship. So the idea that our ship has come in, its first mm -hmm. port is Alaska's first city, is just really exciting to us. Okay, so expand uh, a little bit for me. I had a question that I overheard upstairs about one of the guests said, do we own this ship as the state of Alaska? Expand on that for me. So the ship is actually owned by the National Science Foundation and is part of the NSF UNOLS fleet, a uh, fleet of, of scientific research ships uh, around the world. It's the newest in the, sh in the fleet. It is the only ice strengthened vessel in the fleet. The University of Alaska Fairbanks was selected to manage the procurement, manage the construction, and manage the operation of the ship on behalf of the world scientific community. Okay. And I know you've got high hopes for this ship, but I'd be interested in hearing your opinion as well. Um, absolutely. It's going to really uh, allow us to do research at times of the year we haven't been able to before. Um, it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's very, very versatile. The ship was built with versatility in mind so that lots of different types of research can be done aboard the ship. Um, I don't think we've even figured out what the full capacity is of the ship. Well, you know, I think there's a capacity for the future, too. In education, you may have seen me grin when we were talking upstairs. I'm actually president of our Board of Education. And when you mentioned the possibility for futures for younger students, yeah. that was really intriguing. And actually, as part of our proposal to the National Science Foundation, the University of Alaska Fairbanks committed to essentially pay for 12 ship days a year, which we will use for Alaska-focused research and for K-12 experiences. And we know that for the next generation of ocean and fishery scientists, uh, we need to capture their imagination early. You probably heard the, uh, the captain say that he went on a research ship when he was seven years old and decided he was going to be a ship captain. Now he is. The uh, capability for electronic communication will allow us to do laboratory work here but also have people in laboratories um, on the Fairbanks campus, uh, at the Juno Fisheries Center, and elsewhere that are linked in, in ways that we haven't had been able to do that from ship to shore in the past. That's likely to create additional opportunities, both for our undergraduate students uh, and for our researchers. And for that matter, maybe for some budding young scientists as well. We know that, that we need to capture that imagination. And when kids get on the ship and they look around and they see the equipment, they see the ship, they realize there's something here. And we're going we're gonna to get some excited. And so we're so pleased that the Ketchikan community has turned out in numbers greater than we expected, actually. <laughs> and we weren't quite, weren't quite ready for it. But you know, w we know there are kids in Ketchikan that are going to be working on this ship in 20 years. So speaking of capturing the imaginations of students, one of the other things that I think is important to our state is capturing the education of students here in the state, meaning keeping them here in our state for higher education. So if someone just in case is watching this at home, what are some of those opportunities available at your school? Um, well, They're endless, I know. Give me a couple of highlights. <laughs> Well, we have um, some really interesting facilities across the state uh, that allow for um, experiences like um, learning how to do underwater scientific diving. Um, you know, the, all the techniques that you need for being able to do um, collecting samples in a scientific manner under sea. And we run that particular um, class. It's a college class out of the Kasitsna Bay Laboratory um, across from Homer. So there's one example of kind of a pretty unique opportunity that the school offers. Um, we have um, we have a fisheries program that uh, is physically in Juneau, 
and in Fairbanks and actually because we do a lot of distance delivery students can take many of our classes from across the state so we have a lot of opportunity for people who live in more remote areas to participate in those um, specialized uh, classes. And then actually the University of Alaska Fairbanks works with the other two universities in Alaska, UA Southeast and UA Anchorage, to deal with fisheries, seafood, and maritime industry needs yeah. throughout the state. So, you know, we have good coursework here at the Ketchikan campus of UAS. We have refrigeration at the Matsu campus of UAA. Um, and really trying to make sure, and, and we've had a whole task force the last couple of years looking at what else do we need to support the marine industries. And uh, I'm really pleased that UAF is a part of it with a real strong science focus. So I'm going to ask what may be the trick question. Okay. Let's look a decade ahead of now. What would, what would be the one thing that this ship might have accomplished that you perhaps today never even dreamt possible? What's your dream? Well, I think really understanding the Arctic Ocean and Bering Sea in ways that we've been unable to because we couldn't get into the ice. At a time we know the ice is changing and that we know that, that as the climate shifts we're going to see changes in the ecology, we're going to see changes in the marine environment, we're going to see changes brought on by shipping and other development and really being able to understand what's happening physically what's happening to the marine environment is really critical to Alaska as the, the state that makes the United States an Arctic nation. That's probably the most exciting to me, but, but I will wager that there are, that we will have even more important things that I can't even dream of. I would think so too. Well, thank you for sharing this wonderful experience with Ketchikan. Thank you. Thank you so much.